afternoon all. I'm beginning to think actually most blitz games are flawed from a weakness of the last move perspective. Um, and I wonder, you know, training in this area, like to look for at least two ways, for example, of seeing how you can use the weakness of the opponent's last move and so on, maybe three ways after, just, just training, just from this angle over and over again, just to eradicate this major weakness, which I think it's accompanied by the optimism of playing quickly. Let's go back to the Blitz Herzog Novi 1970, and Fisher actually got to play uh, one of my heroes in chess, David Bronstein, who was a fantastic five-minute chess player, and also, you know, pioneered things like uh, time graphs, and playing against computers, and you know, all sorts of things really. So here Fisher was white against him. They played two games, and um, David played his usual French defence, and we have quite an unusual treatment of the French defence, which uh, David liked really at the time. After bishop b4, it looks like her mainline winner, but now after e5, David plays b6, so he clearly might want to exchange off the light square bishops and sort of weaken white on the light squares. So then we see a3. And instead of the bishop voluntarily giving itself up, this is a slightly different variation, bishop f8, which if these Fisher notes are genuine, <laughs> Fisher was quite uh, uh, critical of this, uh, sort of saying underdevelop underdeve underdeveloping pieces has little to recommend it. I'm not really convinced these are Fisher's notes, to be honest, because this is a very closed position and the time loss isn't that significant in closed positions. I think this is a very interesting variation. Um, so I don't know what you guys on YouTube think. Is this totally outrageous, this undeveloping move? But let's keep this perspective, which I'm pretty convinced Blitz Chess, which we will play a lot of online, uh, has a lot of this weakness of the last move. Um, as far as that sort of repairs g7 actually control against queen g4, so it's got a point against the queen g4 lines. If bishop b4 had a sort of weakness in, in that um, it was loosening g7. Okay, f4. Establishing a pawn wedge in the center. Okay, knight c6 now. So actually, given f4, this knight c6 is actually preparing to put the bishop here. Forget trading. Uh, maybe black can try and castle queenside. So knight f3, now knight h6, as though this juicy light square is going to be used. Bishop d3, knight f5, attacking d4 now. It's protected with knight e2, and now h5. It looks as though black has a kind of grip on the position, a bit symmetrical to a king's engine position, because in the king's engine you have a knight on c5. So black has placed, you know, this 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 nice outpost square on the light square. It looks looks very logical. In the king's end, you have a pawn on a5 and a knight on c5. So this pawn structure is is being uh, used here by black a lot. G3, bishop b7, and even the finchetto, you know, instead of finchetto on this side, finchetto on this side. C3, queen d7. Okay, so we have an interesting start position after queen c2. Black castled queenside, b4, and now f6, opening up the centre. We're trying to open up the centre. Bishop d2, White's careful at the moment not to immediately ca uh, castle, but now he castles. Knight f e7. Okay, so what is going on here with knight f e7? Maybe Black wants uh, to play f5 at some point. No, but that looks unlikely because of the g5 square. I think there's some other ideas behind this which are, which are going to unravel. Rook fb1, h4. Okay, and now the rook goes back to f1 uh, pretty soon actually. Pardon me, the rook doesn't go back to f1. No, Fisher takes this pawn on h4. And now g5, and it's as though black is trying to generate counterplay. He's, he's, he's got this active. Um, root down to white's king, access path, should we call it. And he doesn't mind losing f6 here. It looks as though, you know, with the king there, the bishop on the diagonal, and these two rooks, you know, still on the board, maybe the g and h files are going to be difficult for Fisher. I find this this is, you know, you, you'd be worried to play like this in a five-minute game, snatching this, this h4 pawn 
allowing stuff like g5. So anyway, f takes, and it's double pawns at the moment, so black actually seizes a center pawn with f takes e5. And I think black was doing fine here. It doesn't look strategically that impressive, uh, to be honest with you, um, uh, white's play here, because it looks as though, uh, you know, the center's on the fire. You know, this stuff is not really going to open a line anytime soon against black king. And, you know, black is, is generating lots of counterplay. Maybe bishop g7 is going to be on the cards. But let's see, how does white use use his assets? Rook f1. So now the rook goes to the f file. So it looks as though rook f7 is going to be quite dangerous, pinning the knight maybe, and then g6 maybe, or even knight g6. But we have e takes d4, c takes d4. And now bishop g7. And it looks like, you know, quite a lot of dynamism for black. Pressure on d4, bishop c3, and now e5, you know, liberating the queen as well to be able to join in the attack, potentially liberating the bishop. Rook f7, e takes d4. So offering up the bishop there. And I think at one point, uh, you know, black does get almost a totally winning position here. Rook takes g7, and now rook takes h4. Okay, let's have a look at engine evaluation, because uh, you might think I'm being overly negative for Fisher's play. Apparently it's about equal with d takes c3. No, slightly better, technically, slightly better. You see, I, I, think, I think black has generated counterplay from his unusual opening uh, against Fisher, to be honest. But uh, rook takes h4, perhaps is a little bit on the unsound side. It's taken, but check, you know, it looks very promising as well though, the, these access routes to the white's king here. D takes c3, and now d4, you see the scope of the bishop across this diagonal. Surely there's gonna be some combinations where this queen and this bishop and these knights are gonna potentially cause a lot of damage. Surely, you might ask, queen d2, knight e5. It looks quite frightening here. There's an immediate threat now of knight f3 check, for Kingfisher's queen and king. So he has to parry that. And he's prepared, of course, to give up um, an exchange here. It's, isn't this uh, good for white? But the thing is, white's on e7, and there's no immediate mate on g2 or h1, because the knight's protecting h1. So the other knight gets out of the way. Bishop f5. Okay. And now we see this winning of the exchange back. So black again seems to be doing okay. Look at white's king safety in this position. Okay. Bishop e4. Queen takes a3. Nicking a queen side pawn. Queen takes d4. Check. And it really looks unsafe now uh, for for the king. Fisher goes to uh, g goes to not to g two but to f two, and you just really wouldn't want black to have so much counterplay from such an unusual uh, position. If we did an engine evaluation here, you know black is minus one point four five here. He plays the check, and then bishop f five is played. Sorry, is not played. Knight f5 is played, which apparently this is a clear like win for black here. We're going to plus six point three three for black with knight c3 here. You might wonder why. You know why? Okay, knight c3 was actually played. Okay, and this comes back to what I was saying um, before that. In blitz, I think a lot of moves are played optimistically. And it's the optimism which makes the weakness of the last move a very powerful concept. But we need huge discipline to be able to check different ways of exploiting the weakness of the last move. Fisher now plays bishop takes b7. Okay, bishop takes b7. And we see uh, bishop takes e b7 is loosening control of f5 and c2 at the same time. Okay. So there are two ways of exploiting the weakness of the last move. And I just started this theory earlier today, actually, that I still have a long way to go.
to really get to grips with this. Because sometimes you think, well, you are using the weakness in the last move if you find it just one way. But actually, if you can discipline yourself to see two ways of exploiting the weakness in the last move, then compare and contrast both ways. There are two ways of exploiting the bishop leaving e4. It seems black, you know, the white king was in trouble so far anyway. So why is it that rook takes f5 as the game is so much worse than queen c2 check here? I'll just show you this engine analysis. In this position, David Bronstein played rook takes f5 check. So why why is queen c2 so crushing? Queen c2 check. So let, let's try, I don't know, let's try here and we've got a check to win the queen and there's no compensation for white after that. In fact, it's mate in seven anyway. So you can't go there. If you go here again, knight e2 check. So it seems this check, this simple check here is, is looking pretty crushing. Here it's a mate in one. So where does the king go? If the king has to really go, um, what about did we cover f3, king f3? Then we get an automatic battery with queen takes f5, the rook and queen battery. And it looks as though it's slaughter time for the white king. If white has to give up the queen here, what's going on after king d2? This, this is mating here, isn't it? Takes queen c2. So, okay, so that leaves king e3. And then we have apparently knight d1 check. Very easy for engines to find all this stuff. Now, if the king did go to, if the queen doesn't give itself up, then again, queen takes f5 and it's a lethal battery. The way this weakness of the last move was used, bishop takes b7. We don't know the clock situation. Maybe, maybe David only had like a minute left or something. It's only a five minute game. Uh, so it's, it's easier said than done to sort of sit there and objectively analyze two different ways of exploiting the weakness of the last move here is it you know to, to, com to compare and contrast queen c2 to rook takes f5 okay hopefully you've got more than a minute to do it what is the problem with what was played rook takes f5 check it allowed basically uh the offensive move bishop f3 okay and it seems the worst of the troubles are over because here, say say queen c2 check, the, the bishop is now covering again e2. There's no knight e2. You can just take it here. In the other variation, it would have been a, a queen and king fork. So this is why I'm, I'm starting to think of an increasingly disciplined regime in blitz chess. And this is one of the reasons I was keen to, to carry on looking at these, these blitz games from this 1970 tournament, even between you know, some of the strongest GMs in the world. This weakness of the last move rears its head uh, as being potentially you know a lethal weapon in key situations if you can get it right so not only examine you know what are the negatives the loss of control of, of c2 and f5 but try and look at more than one way of, of exploiting the weakness of the last move so this way let white escape fisher escaped he got bishop f3 in okay the worst is over for white and he's got these two dangerous pawns now and even better, he's got a pin now against the knight, which he's about to use. He's about to sack his queen if necessary. Okay, so so here the rook's on, but there's um, isn't there going to be like a way of winning uh, the queen? Um, in the notes, which I'm not sure are totally genuine, it gives queen takes f5 as a big mistake. Instead, rook g7 uh, was actually forcing. Uh, mate. So here, queen c4 is forcing mate. Yes, that is a huge, a huge thing uh, because you know check, and then we've got queen b7 mate. So that is a bit of a blunder. Yes. <laughs> so in in the game, it seems queen takes f5, which which allows David Bronstein this idea of queen e1 check, and now kind of winning the queen. It seems because the king is going to be forced. Uh, onto a square where the queen and king are going to be forked. So king g4, because if he had played king h3, then we would have queen f1 um, check. Ah, oh, hang on, hang on, and draw, no, 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 just a draw here. If the king 
uh, doesn't go to g2 we've got a draw by perpetual if it go, if it goes to g2 we've got knight e3 okay so he goes to g4 and allows this so he's giving up his queen so rook bishop and queen but he's got these dangerous pass pawns now which are sufficient to um hold hold the position enough uh for a draw they they kind of agreed a draw here um now the evaluation in this final position it looks kind of menacing these two pass pawns so if we add a kibitzer here actually the engine kind of thinks it's about equal in this final position uh we've checked so fair result fair result in the end technically but um yeah it just seems that this is this is my theory i, I mean feel free to disagree in the comments but if we imagine that most most blitz chess is played very optimistically then with optimistic moves you will get these huge weaknesses of the last move and maybe you know the better blitz players pounce on that so they, they haven't got these grand depth conceptions you know which they've extracted from some of their hundreds of chess books now i think i think on a very practical level uh maybe increasing discipline in this area to look at the weaknesses of the last move and look at maybe you know for example more than one way more than two ways if you can manage it if if it exists if more than one way exists of exploiting the weakness of the last move because sometimes that can be crucial as this demonstrates that the bishop just leaving you know later uh left a, a very lethal check and you know black had made all this effort to strip bare the white king and to a large extent he was successful in activating pieces and getting his rooks going against the white king the white king started to look really really shaky here um even you know this conception of you know may, maybe um so d takes c3 w was better here um that than the game continuation apparently uh, and the engine seems to seems to like d takes c3 okay but even so you know black got tremendous pressure here he's still got this bishop activated fundamentally his queen and his knights are still dangerous in this position it's not the sort of position one would necessarily like with the white pieces um, if you look at the con much more controlled win against tau and i think it was in an earlier round it may have been in an earlier round where fisher played a much more solid opening you know none of this huge counterplay was evident there so Bronstein's getting an exchange back and literally was on the verge, verge of winning you know a slight detour to win a queenside pawn not not for inning but the queen comes back with a vengeance pretty soon for a very important check on c1 here i guess you can argue that this is also a weakness of the last move pouncing on the c1 check um yeah and to expose the king even more and you, you would think that you know this this is the firing squad really these two this is the heavy artillery pointed at the white king so knight f5 and now knight c3 really just dismantles uh you know the white's shield it's incredible that fisher actually uh survives this position and gets away with bishop takes b7 it's it's just totally um a disastrous position if the right move is played here but we're not computers so david must have thought rook f5 is enough but uh the way to do it uh without the bishop coming back with a useful defensive role was queen c2 here so this this i mean shows that the, the thing is this might be an important theory because because so many of us are now playing blitz chess online so if we can actually prove this is a viable concept even between grandmasters playing five minute chess then surely it's it's even more critical uh and and in evidence in our own games we can expect very optimistic moves from the opponents but there's there's a number of other aspects in this game which are interesting how black generate counterplay he played an unusual shock you know system for white maybe white overestimate he played very aggressively castling on the queen side he played very aggressively to strip open the white king so credit to david bronstein he was one of the few people not to lose in this blitz tournament of 1970 uh, with the black pieces as well he held fisher to a draw comments or questions on youtube thanks very much